Well, good evening. Welcome to another edition of How to Rock the Stage. I'm your host again, The Trigger, Rich Bond Trigger. Welcome back and happy post Thanksgiving, early Christmas, as I'm in Washington, D.C., and the Christmas lights of the Capitol Tree has officially been lit. So, welcome to the holiday season. Greetings from Rock the Stage. Tonight, we're going to be talking about production values and event values and how do you make great, exciting events in this new virtual age that we find ourselves in? It's an exciting time. And from my perspective, you've heard me say it before, the virtual stage is ever expanding. And tonight we're going to talk about some amazing things that are happening and what our guest is doing in this new exciting virtual space with large events and global events. He has a great history. We're going to dive in that in just a couple of minutes. Coming up next week, we are back again at a regular time, 7 o'clock Eastern time. Mark Hirschberg will be my guest. And we're going to talk about Next Generation Media. He has an amazing new app and tool he's created. And it's going to blur the line between visual technology, publishing, and much more. You don't want to miss that one. And then on December the 14th, midway through the month, we're going to have Terry Knott with us. And it's going to be virtual testimonies. Another one of these new elements is being coming up. That he's created another app, a different service to actually grab testimonies, make it easier to put on your website, to put into your email campaigns. It's two very exciting technical shows coming up back to back here on How to Rock the Stage. But tonight we're going to be getting back into it. And our guest is a veteran and an Emmy award winning camera operator, Howie Zales. He's turned his passion for television broadcasting into several entre entrepreneur endeavors. How he's created the HJZ Productions in 2000 to address the need for professional level sports staffing in the New York market. In 2019, how he and his team founded Verdidity Entertainment Services, or just VES. He offers those best classes, broadcast quality live streams of professional sports shows and concerts. VES also produces corporate meetings and events. He and I were just talking about that backstage, and he also has a still love to work with sports, and he has created the TV Sports Course, a hands-on training boot camp for the next generation of television crew professionals, and coming out of the sports world myself, I love to hear more about that all the time. Welcome to the virtual stage tonight, Howie Zale. Great to see you, Howie. Hey, Rich. Thanks for having me. You have a rich history of working behind the scenes. And let's just start there. What's it like to be traveling behind the scenes? You are in the middle of it, down on the field, up in the crow's nest. You see all these amazing things, but no one knows who you really are. What's that like? I tell you, I'm the, one of the luckiest people on the planet. I, I would have done my job for free. I, I got to see the world for over 20 years, traveling to sporting and entertainment events that, uh, you know, we're some of the biggest around from Super Bowls to Olympics to Kentucky Derbies to WrestleManias. Uh, I've just had the good fortune to, you know, have a great career. Then pandemic hits and from the big mega stage and all, I mean, everything shut down. Yeah. What was it like for you to go through that period of there is no big stadium, there is no big crowd, but I love the camera and I love what I do. How, how did you go through that? Well, for the first time in my professional life, I was not getting on a plane four times a week. Uh, so that was one quick adjustment. Um, and the other thing is, you know, as a freelancer uh, or independent contractor, you only get paid when you work. Um, so that was obviously one concern. But um, since 2000, I had this business on the side where we hire sports and entertainment crew for the same types of events that I was doing as a camera operator. So uh, if you were, I know you're in DC, so if you were watching a, a Nationals game on TV, we would be contacted to hire the TV crew, camera operators, audio people, replay people to produce those types of events. Uh, so the one fortunate thing we had going for us leading into the pandemic was we were owed a lot of money from clients from past jobs that we had paid people already. So we had a lot of money that was coming in. So it gave us a little, uh, you know, uh, breathing, breathing room. Since then, you have pivoted into the virtual space. First of all, do you mm -hmm. agree with my statement that the virtual stage is ever expanding? Yes, completely. 
Where do you think this is going? Because you now are producing through your own company, mega events, sports events, but you've also gone different directions. You're not just in one lane. It's really already exploded for you, hasn't it? Yeah, uh, the, the, where it's taking off right now in this coming year is the live shopping experience where you could be watching, and we've already done this with clients, where you can be watching on your uh, mobile device, your phone, um, the you know influencers that are typically used, right, will be modeling clothes or accessories, whatever they're trying to sell. And in a little box at the bottom of the screen will be the item that they're selling. And you, all you have to do is click on that little box, that little item, and it'll go right to your cart. Nothing else has to be done. Just it's going to be a $200 bang billion bang. Dollar business. Yeah. What will that do for other industries once they figure out that's really viable? It's just going to, it, it's going to enhance everything. I, I, but I do think like the going to the store, the days of going to the store, the mall, I really think that's, that's over. So since you brought that up during pandemic, people were reaching out to me saying, what do you think about the sports world, Rich? Uh, we're shut down and things like that. These mega arenas we're not going to use. People like us, we're not going to use. And the question was, what's going to happen next? My yeah. original thought was we're never going back to mega crowds. I think the mid-size baseball stadiums are going to reemerge. I think mid-size venues are going to reemerge because the virtual will now become part of it. I haven't seen that happen yet, but do you think we're going to see that kind of morphing where the mega crowds aren't really going to stick around? Um, I think in the sports world, it's a little bit different. I think the crowds will still show up for sporting events. Um, but uh, uh, the streaming part of those sporting events is never going away. If anything, it's only getting bigger. And what I mean by that is um, the smaller events that are, are that don't have the broadcast money because it takes a lot of money, as you know, to put on a television show just to rent a TV truck mm -hmm. could be uh, $20,000 for the day. So um, like smaller track and field events, high school sports, non-division one uh, college events, those are now going to be live streamed and uh, with the, with different, there's, everyone has a different way of doing it, yeah. um, but you can do it for so much cheaper than producing uh, a, a television show. I was sitting in a, a pub uh, a couple of weeks ago and flipping through and I think it was ESPN two, three, five, whatever it is now, but they had cornhole competition. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Where did that come from? That opened up my whole idea to how vast this can go. If we're watching Cornhole and they have jerseys on and they have sponsor boards up for Cornhole, what can't we put on the streaming anymore, right? Right. <laughs> Let's get into the production side because you are a production genius. You're getting into this. And we're, we're going to have our poll question coming up here in just a few moments. But how heavy should people who are getting into this virtual space want to get production quality? Does the average Joe really care about production quality or do they just want to get through the events? How do we help them? Yeah, I, I think quality is everything. And um, it, it, you may have the best intentions, the best message uh, to put forth, but if you don't sound good, and I put sound first, if you don't sound good, it doesn't matter what you're saying and it, because people are not going to hear, be able to hear yeah. you. And if you don't look good, and I'm not talking about your looks, I'm talking about if you're not well lit, if your camera is out of focus, if the books behind you are in focus and your eyes are blurry, that d takes your uh, takes your brain away from what the, you're trying to concentrate on as a viewer, and you're not paying attention to the message that the uh, that the video is trying to put forth. And I want everyone to make sure they understood what he was also saying, the audio first, people will put up with a bad video. But if the audio is really bad, they're not sticking around, they can't hear, they don't understand. It's really important to get the audio right first, and then working on all the other magic. Right. And it and it, it's it's basic stuff and it doesn't have to be very expensive. And what we tell people is, you know, no AirPods for microphones, um, because we've had plenty of people show up with dead AirPods. Um, and if you're in a remote situation and you're not familiar with how to do it, we it's hard to talk someone through 
making one AirPod the microphone and one the listen. Um, so a separate microphone uh, to sit on your desk as front as close to you as possible. Um, uh, Yeti microphones, Rode microphones, or some are under a hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. uh, and and you know you can get away with a good webcam and be fine. Start simple uh, again during the pandemic. Yep. Too many people bought too much stuff, and they didn't know what they're doing, how they use it, and then they right. like, threw it away. They just put it back in the closet. This is dumb. This is stupid. It's never going to work. Instead of taking a breath and realizing, go simple first, and then grow bigger and bigger. Right. Um, that was probably some of the best advice I gave a lot of clients early on was start small. Don't waste your big coin. Someday you, maybe you'll get there, but you don't need it right now. <laughs> right. Let's open up our poll question for tonight. It is about production here tonight. And how important is it for you, our viewers here tonight, to have production quality for your events? Is it extremely high? You want great quality? Is it you don't consider it at all? You've never really had that thought about it? Or maybe it's just important. Not extremely important, but it's important. Maybe it's becoming more important to you all the time, or you've never, ever considered what the quality should be or could be. So we're going to let the poll roll for a while. Everyone can jump on it. Don't forget the Q&A box is open. The chat box is open. So you can drop in comments as Howie and I continue to go on. And so take us through. You are given a job. You're given a new virtual event to run. How yeah. do you make sure the quality is going to be there from your lens, from what you do? How do you prepare for that quality experience? Great question. So the first thing we'll do is once, you know, the client gives us the go ahead that, uh, you know, this event is going to happen, we'll find out the, the location. And then um, one or two of my team members and I will go and do what we call a, a location scout or a site survey. We'll visit the, the exact room, the exact location where it's going to happen. We'll take measurements. How far is the camera going to be? The camera is going to be from the stage. How many people are going to be on the stage? Um, what is the lighting like? What's the color of the background? Uh, do we need monitors? Where are we going to put the monitors if we need them? How much power is in the room? What is the internet in a, in a virtual situation? We need to know the upload speed and is our internet a dedicated line that only we have access to that someone else cannot jump on? Um, I know that sounds a little technical maybe, but for us, that's important. But that's really um, important because I just did a book launch recently and it was a hybrid event. And one of the first things I did was I asked the gentleman renting the facilities, do they have a de dedicated line for us? Because I don't want right. everyone else in this open area all sucking down the, <laughs> the rate and the speed while we're streaming live. So they let us jump into their private staff line. But that is a huge question to ask people now. And a lot of people aren't thinking about that, Howie. Yeah, and we actually, uh, we take it another step further and I have a IT team. We come with our own equipment to make it a private line um, without getting into all the technical weeds of it. But uh, we basically take that line and make it private and no one else can jump up, jump on it. Um, and we want to make sure that, uh, uh, you know, we have a, a remote team working on all of our productions that all of the internet ports are open for incoming and outgoing traffic. So our remote team could, could be a, a part of the production. Um, so we test all that during the site survey. Then I'll come back to my office. I'll write up uh, a production and tech plan and eventually distribute it to everyone that's involved in the production. And then um, we will not do a production or an event uh, without having a setup day slash rehearsal day. Uh, it's just too much to do in one day, especially uh, uh, in, in an area where anything could happen when you're dealing with technology. So that's even true for the business conference and special events. Like you were just telling me backstage, you do some yep. pretty big stuff, even multi-language stuff. So you need that full prep day to make sure yep. when the event goes live, we've got no issues. Yeah, because let's say the event goes live at 10 o'clock in the morning. Uh, we might be there for eight hours the day before setting up. Um, it involves, because we always run into roadblocks with the internet. Even though we've gone there and tested it, something's changed between the day we've been there and the day of the production. So uh, then we need to set up our cameras and our lighting. And we always like to have a rehearsal 
Uh, and we always tell our clients the sloppiest rehearsals make the best productions because we try to have every situation scenario go wrong in the rehearsal. So we know what to anticipate for the production, for the actual production. And that's another really golden nugget. I've done a lot of live events and people usually stress out when it goes sideways. And I have the same right. approach. We're getting all the bugs out. We're learning an immense amount of things here. And they're thinking, let's trash it. Let's cancel it. This is a horrible idea. Whereas they don't see what you just described as this is going to help us so much when the right. real time really comes. The clients are like, who in the heck did we hire to do this? And we're like, no, we're doing, this is like purpose. We're, we're, we're making sure that all of anything that can possibly go wrong, we're trying to make go wrong. So it doesn't go wrong tomorrow. So on your events, are you the quarterback calling the production shots? Are you the one now in the main control center saying camera one, camera two, switch here? This guest um, comes so in that would not? be... That would be the director. Uh, I'm training to do that. I, we I usually have the same director on all of our shows, uh, but I'm overall technically in charge. And then I have like department heads. I have the head of our audio department. I have the head of our IT department um, and then our director. And uh, a lot of times we'll have a producer. So there's like five or six of us that work on, on all of our productions. And then depending where it's actually taking place is who do we hire for our on-site camera crew, our on-site audio team? Um, do we need a lighting and grip truck? Do we need teleprompters? Uh, do we need to rent monitors uh, for slides presentations? So um, the other people is all dependent on what is necessary for the production. I want to go back because probably a lot of people don't think about this, but I want to go back to the earpiece and the comments you made about the iPad, uh, the um, earbuds. Yep. People do not realize if you're watching the NFL, the, the announcers are going, they're getting stats. There's a fumble. There's a guy down in the field. There's other people talking in their ears simultaneously, and they have to keep the flow of the game and the action going while not stumbling over the words, but listening to sideline reporters, cameramen. Can you talk us through how important that is, the more elevated you get and how to really work your brain that way? Because people are not wired for this. Yeah, yeah, no. And you have to compartmentalize different aspects of the information because um, uh, if, if you're the color, con if you're the announcers, right, you're hearing your partner talking, but you're not hearing yourself because that would mess you up. Yep. You're also hearing, um, if you're the uh, commentators, you're hearing the producer counting you down. You're hearing uh, them telling you which replay you're going to. Then out, you're also, if you're the color commentator, you're pressing the button, talking to the producer, telling them which replay angles you want to see. So it, there, there's a lot of back and forth and uh knowing which buttons to press to make sure that your talking is not going over the air when you don't want it to and that it is when you want it to uh, as a camera operator on the field if you're operating a handheld camera you're wearing a one head one-sided headset you're listening to the director and you're listening to the announcers all through the same same side because you want to show what the announcers are talking about you're telling a story through your pictures matching what the announcers are saying while listening to the director. So there's a lot of simultaneous talking going on. And, and it's like a dance. It's like a concert where you're all trying to fill in together without overstepping each other. How long does it take to get that rhythm as a team to make high quality productions? Because well, I know, I'm, for example, during preseason, if you change your teammate on your play-by-play -play team, I know they rehearse over the summer with other games very often to get everyone in the flow before the real NFL games kick off, right? Right. Yeah, as a, as a, as a camera operator and uh, well, at the network level, you're, um, a lot of us have traveled together for years. So, you know, it, it's, it's almost a well-oiled machine. Everyone has a responsibility. Um, football, most sports, uh, almost all sports, uh, has a formula on how it's uh, shot. Uh, and in football, it's 
who has the ball and which direction is it going and where's the ball located. And that's what your responsibility, that's how your responsibility is determined in baseball. It's what camera are you? What righty or lefty batter is it up and how many outs are there and are there runners on base? And that determines your responsibilities. So when people run their own virtual events, when they're getting into this now, you know, everyone's thinking multi-camera, I want to make it so cool. I want to do cutaways and, Help people get their head wrapped around that beginners. When you really start, should you do a one camera shoot, a two camera shoot? Should you do it in post-production and make it come together, make it look good afterwards? How would you help somebody out that really gets started with this? Yeah. So let's say you're, you're, you, you have a, a host and two panelists. Okay. Uh, we'll just make it simple. We'll start simple. Um, we would suggest three cameras, one wide shot to include all three people one camera to shoot the host and that camera never leaves the host and another camera on the opposite side cross shooting the two panelists that can get a two shot or float between singles on whoever's talking and then we just cut back and forth between the host the wide the tight of the of the guests and uh, it just makes for a simple flow of the production, keeps it interesting because the camera angles are changing every few seconds, but it's not jarring uh, and taking your, uh, you know, it's not jarring. Yeah, because of that quick shot that people like snap or if you have right. it zoomed in too close, you freak people out. So there's that whole balancing act of what you want the shot to look like. And then right. the next shot's also coming up as well. So you're, you're again, hearing multiple things, aren't you? Yeah. And, you know, if there's a slide presentation that's involved, we'll incorporate the slides full screen so you can see them. If um, let's say there's uh, a speaker at a podium um, that is uh, using slides, uh, PowerPoint slides as part of their presentation, it will use graphics to uh, make it more interesting. And what I mean by that is we'll make a two box uh, graphic. We'll put the person in a small box. Mm -hmm. and the slides in a bigger box so they're on screen at the same time then we'll cut to the slides full then we'll cut back to the two box look of the person in the slide then maybe we'll go back to just the person and then so we're cutting back and forth keeping the viewer's interest without making it jarring and giving them the information that they need we're going to go back to our poll real quickly here because the, the results are in on our how important is it and extremely high <laughs> for this came out across the board. I, I, I didn't know if people were going to be really that into it, but that's, that, that's very cool to hear that we have people watching and listening tonight, and hopefully on the replay as well, they realize the quality is important. It's not just the content. The quality does matter. Yes. When it comes to how fast should you edit, how fast should you have transition? Because some people... Are trying to figure out do you do a long a short a, what is the rhythm now for that pacing of making an event virtually engaging so they do stay with it i, I don't think there's any set formula to that you you, you want to let it breathe you want to um keep the viewer's attention by changing the camera angles but you want to let it breathe uh if you're on a slide that has a lot of information you want to stay on the slide so the viewer can read everything that is on the slide. Um, if there's not so, if there's not a lot of information, there's only one or two sentences. So you stay on the slide a little less, or you stay in the two shot of the box and the person uh, a little less, and maybe you include the person more uh, during that time frame. So it all kind of depends on what's going on. From your overall career and experience, what was the most hairiest, challenging live event that you were in the middle of and it could have gone sideways, but you guys pulled it out and it really came across really amazing. The hairiest. Um, so when we, our first big show, two, two things, our first shows during the pandemic, um, a client called and said, we in, need to interview nine baseball players in nine separate cities. Uh, but the interviewer could not leave her house. And he's like, can you do that? And I'm like, of course. So I hung up the phone and I called my wife. I said, Jenny, I said, 
I don't know what I just agreed to, but I have no idea how we're going to pull this off. So I turned to my network and uh, we came up with these contributor kits that we send out to our remote guests with high-end laptops, um, ca uh, high-def cameras, USB microphones, ring lights, ethernet cables. Um, and that's how we, and, and since it's our computer, we can dial in through TeamViewer, a piece of software, uh, take control of the, the computer um, and focus the camera, change the color temperature, white balance the camera, uh, change the brightness, uh, manipulate the audio before it even leaves a person's house or office, wherever they're located. So that was like the like for us that was like the biggest technical achievement because that was early on in the pandemic and no one was doing this. Um, and then the second was we uh, went out to uh, Portland, Oregon, and did a four camera cooking show uh, live stream early on in the pandemic. Uh, we rented an RV and we made the RV our little TV truck and uh, we we pulled it off. No. To me, that's fun. That's exciting. For other people, mm -hmm. it may scare the daylights out and to think about those type of make the deal, make it happen and fly. But I, I thrive on that. Do you, yeah. do, 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 do you thrive on those type of days? Yes. Yes. And I was, you know, when I was shooting before I stopped uh, shooting, I, 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 in football, I was always a handheld on the sideline and I prayed for the ball to come my way. Uh, just to get the replay you know that's just <laughs> part of my personality howie zale is with us tonight again coming up is going to be open q a time you can ask him your questions we'll stick around we're going to beam you in cameras and microphones on and ask him your production questions or other media related things what is maybe one or two easy tips for people to again up the game here a little bit think a little bit higher quality but not blow their budget because again a lot of it is they want to try it, but they don't want to invest a lot and find out they bought the wrong gizmo. Yeah. Uh, you know what? Um, I just have it ha happened sitting right here. You can do it really cheaply. It's a loom cube. It's uh, I don't know how well you can see it, but it sits right on your desk and yep. it has a microphone yourself. Your mobile device goes right there. A little light goes right here. I don't know. Maybe it's $50 and it's just a way to practice you know, creating your own content, if that's something you want to do for cheap. And then if that's something you really want to do, then maybe you invest in a, in a high end or a higher end camera and lighting in the future. So I saw you had the muff on it. You had the big fur coat on that. Yeah, yeah. Um, for that quality and for sound, because sound is so important. I don't use a splash shield, but I know a lot of people do. Do you recommend that or should people just... Uh, kind of Kind of learn a yeah, little. Yeah, uh, it's it's more like uh, like for pop filters for the mm -hmm. for the P's, the B's, so it doesn't doesn't you know come out. And this is also made uh to go outside, you know. And I'm the type of person that if I don't have it on, I'm gonna lose it. <laughs> <laughs> what about because because again, the audio sound is so important. Lapels over handhelds over ears. Which do you think are the best for the growth of this industry in this virtual space? Uh, that's that's a difficult question in the sense that they make some cheap lapel mics that are not good quality. Um, wireless microphones that are good quality are thousands um, for different reasons. One for the wireless part, for the RF part, to make sure that there's no interference. For the microphone part, for the sound, um, it's so uh, it's hard to say because good audio uh, is is expensive. I think like the best bang for your buck is like a, a Yeti a Yeti Blue USB that can plug into your computer or into a Focusrite or a Rode that can mm. plug into your computer or a Focusrite. People love it being wireless, but believe me, when you're doing live productions, yeah, nothing better than having a cord tethered than you to directly in. And um, as a TV professional, uh, and we do a lot of feature shoots for clients, we never do any wirelesses without a dedicated audio person there that monitors it because um, it may be good going to the audio person, but there's a whole gap between the audio person and the camera person. So uh, 
Yeah, unless you have the proper monitoring equipment, wireless is not suggested. Oh, he sales is our guest. We're going to uh, have him share right now. What's, what's the best way to find you, get in touch with you? We're going to get ready for the second half of the show where okay. everyone else gets to ask you the question, but how's the best way to get in touch with you? Yeah, our, our, our HowieZales.com um, and all of our company websites are found underneath HowieZales.com. Our uh, events and streaming company, Veridity Entertainment. Uh, dot com uh, or on LinkedIn at Howard Zales. And I'm dropping in the chat just because we have a couple of his right there. You can grab those. He is easy to find on LinkedIn and he is in the New York area. So yes. uh, when you find him, you're going to know who he is. So Howie, stick around for a minute. We're going to do a little business and come on back here. Just want to remind everybody that uh, we are back next week for another great show. And again, we're going to get into apps. We're going to get into some virtual streaming apps. are going to help you out. Mark Hirschberg will be my guest. And the next generation media, we're going to pick up the conversation on how this app is helping authors, speakers, and other ways with very creative ways it incorporates in so many different aspects. And then on December the 14th, Terry Noet is going to be my guest. And virtual testimony, you need testimonies on your website. You need testimony to elevate you and your brand authority and how you help people. We're going to have a great time conversation on virtual testimonies. As always, if you ever need any help to better rock the stage, I'm here to coach you up, to equip you to better produce podcasts, TV shows, streaming content. And especially if you're wanting more podcast interviews, if you're wanting to be interviewed on more shows, I have a special course just to help you to shine on camera and stage. Make sure you're a good interview and get those great sound bites. Contact me, Rich, at richbontrigger.net or just go to rockthestagemedia.com.